Hello, everyone, and welcome to our keynote session for the Modern Sales Pros July Virtual Summit with the wonderfully clickbaity title, The Funnel is Dead. For those of you who haven't joined MSP events in the past, or for those of you who maybe this is the first session you've joined with this summit, our mission as a community is to help our members answer questions they'd otherwise struggle to solve on their own or see around corners that they may not know are coming. As part of pulling together the content and the programming for our summit, uh, we really focused on this transition that's happening in revenue orgs from instead of thinking about their organization function out, really thinking customer in. In our session wouldn't be possible, in our sessions this week wouldn't be possible without the generous sponsorship of a number of organizations. Everything we do in Modern Sales Pros is free for our community members and these sponsors allow us to help execute and share this amazing knowledge with you. And we're actually at the halfway point of our summit. So we are right there smack dab in the middle on Wednesday. After Todd Capone wraps here, and we're gonna introduce him in a second, this afternoon we have a session all about data and aligning things based on data. You can't really build a customer in organization if you don't have a clear understanding of what your customer is doing at each step of their journey. Just one housekeeping note for folks, actually two. Uh, first, this session is being recorded as you heard when you joined in. So that recording will be up on YouTube later on today, early tomorrow. And then second, if you can, please do use the Q&A panel. I know there may be some folks that get eager and put it in chat, that's totally okay. But enough housekeeping. I am really, really excited to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to read the transparency sale or see Todd Capone speak, you're in for a treat. For those of you who have, and you've seen Todd a bunch of times, you're also in for a treat because we're hitting on some new concepts that Todd has never discussed publicly before, which is awesome. Um, I can't say enough positive things about it, but I'm gonna hand it over to the man himself to introduce himself, Todd Caponi. Thank you so much for joining us here and offering to keynote our session uh, this afternoon. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Second of all, this headshot right there, I don't know if you can tell, it was like five below wind chill when I had that done. My eyes were watering. I look like I'm going to uh, break into a billion pieces right there. But uh, anyway, thank you for having me. The, the transparency starts right there. I mean, we hear the background of the picture and everything. It's, it's, that's, a solid, that's, that's a solid headshot relative to some of the other ones where it doesn't look anything like that person uh, anymore. Um, Todd, one thing before we jump into the session today, maybe just give a little bit of your background um, because I think maybe for folks that are new to transparency sale or new to Todd Capone, probably a couple context before we jump in. Well, yeah, so um, I don't know where this started in my life, but I've always been a behavioral and decision science nerd. Like I've just always found that if, if I'm gonna be in sales, I should know how the human brain engages and prioritizes and decides and buys. And I, I think that's helped me a little bit in my career. I was uh, what I call a B plus, A minus sales rep. Uh, but then I always knew that sales leadership was my thing. Uh, I've been a seven time sales leader, including being on the sales leadership team at Exact Target through their IPO and then their eventual uh, almost $3 billion exit to Salesforce. And then I helped uh, rebuild power reviews from the ground up. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this in a minute, but there was a research study in 2017 that changed my life. Like I'm sure that happens all the time um, to people No, uh, But it happened to me where I was like, I gotta get these ideas out there. It led to me like a lunatic writing a book and I've uh, been what I call uh, accidentally successful, but now I teach and I speak about this stuff all day long. And then I'm part of the way through writing my next book, which is the transparent sales leader that if I can hit my deadlines will be out at the end of February. And I'm sure it's gonna be a hot Valentine's day gift. So get it ready for your partner <laughs> now right. already pre-order. Well, Todd, I'm, I'm real excited to have this conversation with you. And I know it's going to be a jam session here. One thing for our audience, ask questions. This is meant to be as interactive. We've got Todd for about another 45 minutes to an hour. Anything you want to know, we're happy to weigh in on this. He is literally a sales historian. So uh, please do bring the thunder. Todd, you want to kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, thank you again for having me. For everybody else, like welcome to my home. Yeah, that is a shake weight back there. Um, I've, uh, but anyway, plenty of seating for everybody. And the, the point I'm bringing is, as Richard said, throw questions in the Q and A. Uh, this is meant to us have a nice interactive chat. 
Um, to start, so I'm going to go right into it. I think you all know, because you're all part of MSP and you've been paying attention, that we're kind of in the middle of like a sales technology revolution right now, right? Like I saw somebody posted on LinkedIn, uh, and I, I'm sure more than one person did this, but there's a like a slide that's got all the little logos on it of all the sales tech stack tools. And like, it's gotten so small that like you, you can't even see these things. So we're in the middle of a sales tech revolution. Now, many are talking about this idea that, hey, because of this sales tech revolution, the world of selling is going to be revolutionized. It's going to change dramatically in the next 10 years because of technology. That may be true. However, they also say that those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. And here's what I mean by that. I am, you know, it's July 14th. That, that's really cool for me being a sales history nerd for a weird reason that 105 years ago, so 105 years ago today, wrapped up what was called the World Sales Congress in Detroit, Michigan. Now it was the first of its kind. The World Sales Congress was attended by 3000 people you know, with all the, the kind of the sales conferences coming up. 105 years ago, today was the end of the first of its kind. Now, the reason I bring this up is, first of all, I, this is a picture from it. This is President Woodrow Wilson keynoting a sales conference. Now, imagine we're at the Funnel is Dead MSP conference, and Richard's like, hey, uh, Todd, thanks for being our opener. Um, our next keynote is the president. Like, wouldn't you think that was weird? Like, why on earth is the president keynoting a sales conference. We well, tried, Todd. We tried, and I'm sorry, but it's just you. I know we had talked about getting it, but it's it's just going to be you today. Exactly. Like, who knew? So, I mean, first of all, you think about the importance of this thing. Now, imagine if today we were also in the middle of a world war. Like, wouldn't that even be crazier? You got the president at a sales conference in the middle of a world war. That was the case with Woodrow Wilson. He was giving this speech on July 10th of 1916, 105 years ago at that World Sales Congress. Now, the reason I bring this up is because this idea that back then, 105 years ago, sales was such an important component to the economy of the United States, meaning we are in this kind of progressive era of the industrial revolution. So like people had figured out that, hey, you know what? We could do assembly lines and we can, we can leverage chemicals we learned how to leverage steam a long time ago, but we can build stuff, we can manufacture at scale, and we can distribute it now. So that was the explosion, right? The early 1900s. Woodrow Wilson spoke at the World Sales Congress because this country was counting on salespeople, counting on them because when salespeople sold the right products to the right companies at the right time, doing right by the customer, putting the customer first, the whole economy lifted, right? That when those companies succeeded, they hired more people. And when they hired more people, everybody flourished. And as a result of a salesperson selling the right solutions, everybody wins. And so sales was such an important component of our economy and our ability as Americans to establish ourselves as a world leader, all right? So at the time, salespeople trusted, respected, even admired, Oh, what happens? What happened? If we fast forward to December of this last year, Gallup comes out with their annual most to least trusted professions list. Guess what's scraping the bottom again for maybe the 15th straight year? Salespeople, right? It's insurance salespeople, car salespeople, members of Congress and senators. Like there we are lumped at the bottom of that. Wow. <laughs> what happened? Well, I want to talk to you about that. I think that misuse of technology happened. All right. So that's my opinion on that. And so what I want to take you through is a little bit of history, but as we're really kind of in, embracing this whole sales tech stack revolution, that we've got to have the right mindset. Otherwise we're doomed to repeat history again and make it even worse because tech when used right can actually uplift our entire profession. That's part of the reason why I wrote this book, but now I'm seeing all the kind of like the history associated with it. And I see us kind of repeating some of the things and the mistakes that we've done in the past that led us to where we are today. And I think there's a huge opportunity for us to get better. 
All right. So let's talk about that. Let's start with sales technology. So back in the early 1900s, there was a piece of technology that came out that was so profound that everybody was like, oh, the whole sales world's going to change forever. It was the telephone, right? So this telephone came out. So instead of me having to go door to door, face to face and go see you and go talk to you and go try to get through the receptionist and have those conversations, I could now sit here at my desk and make calls, right? Like that started back then. What an incredible gift we were all given in the sales profession. And guess what? We ruined it, didn't we, right? Salespeople ruined it by you know, doing their aggressive phone techniques and tactics and going after customers and calling them during dinner and not letting them go and fishing and spam, like all of that started to happen to the point where a whole nother industry had to be created, which was a technology industry focused on sales prevention. I know that sounds crazy, but this woman, Dr. Shirley Jackson, she was responsible for inventing the technology that led to the creation of caller ID. Caller ID, a sales prevention technology, right? And guess what? That didn't work. So the government had to get involved. And how did the government get involved? The government had to create, this is the Federal Trade Commission creating the do not call registry. You know how many phone numbers are on the do not call registry as of a couple of weeks ago? 221 million, right? Why are those 221 million people on that list? Because they don't want to be sold to, right? We took a great technology and there was a small group that, that made it bad. All right, so let's fast forward a little bit. What came next? Well, this guy, Ray Tomlinson, 1971. So exactly 50 years ago, I think it was the summer of 1971, Ray Tomlinson so, uh, sent the first email. So two desks sitting in a room sent one email to the other right? Email, this incredible tool where I can write you a note, I can hit send, boom, it's in your inbox instantly. I don't have to wait for somebody to come pick it up in a truck and take it to a distribution center and send it and it gets there four days later. I can send it, it shows up like what amazing sales gift. It's a gift that we have been given and what did we do? Well, we ruined it. Like we ruined it again, right? to the point where a whole group of people had to get together and create sales prevention technology, which is spam filters and IP blacklists that all the internet service providers have created, right? So we've got this whole industry there and whew, once again, didn't work. The government had to get involved again to prevent you salespeople from ruining technology. This is a picture from 2003 at the signing of the legislation called CAN SPAM, right? And can, by the way, the A in the first word, can, is assault. Like they viewed salespeople sending emails as an assault. It was like, I don't remember what the first word is, but it's assault, a non-solicited pornography and marketing, right? So that's the A-N-S-P-A-M. I don't, the C is, there's another word in there. But the point being, we as salespeople, we've consistently done this where we've been giving these incredible gifts and we continue to mess it up. I think that there's a couple of things that have happened here. And so when you think about all this technology that you're considering bringing on and you're, you're looking at it through the lens of the dirtiest four word or four letter word that I can think of, which is actually it's a five letter word that was really dumb is scale. When we get blinded by scale and we use technology for evil instead of good, that's where things break. That's where relationships break. When we get this idea that, hey, if I just have to send out a million emails, if even three people respond, that's three people that I would have never known about if I didn't send out those million emails and annoy those other 999 million, right? So it, that's the scale is a dirty word. Now, the other piece though is 1916. What was the difference? Every sale required a face to face human interaction, right? you had to sit across the desk from somebody. I mean, there was mail order, there was catalogs and stuff, but that's, that's not true sales. Sales required a conversation at a human level where I'm looking at you in the eyes and you're trusting me and I'm trusting you. Those tools like the telephone and like email, they took away our face. They made it easier for us to get away with doing things that were a little bit shady. And I think we have to, first of all, get our face back. And that face is not we have to get face to face with people, get on planes and all that. That's not what I mean. It means being a human being and recognize 
that just like in 1916, when our customers succeed, they grow. When they grow, they hire. When they hire, they spend more. When they spend more, the whole economy lifts up. And guess what? When you're selling products and solutions to companies that are doing well, you get to do well too, right? Because you sell more, those customers stay, they renew, sure. But the whole economy is growing as a result. And so I'll take a deep breath there because I think that that's a good place to kind of transition to this next piece, which is how do we get that face back? Todd, give us some things that we can actually use like right away. And so I want to, <clears throat> I want to take you through that, but Richard, how are you feeling so far? I love that. I think this is great. And it's funny too, as I had mentioned when we were prepping Todd, we had on Tyler Lassard yesterday from Vidyard and that question came up, Hey, this, this video tech is really cool. Are we going to, are we going to goof this one up too? Yeah. And the answer is emphatically yes. The, the other example I'd put out, and I think folks, uh, maybe that have done B2C marketing as well. Same thing happened with push notifications. The exact same yes. thing. We get legislation, but we have an iOS message center now. Five, 10 years ago, we didn't. And I could just literally make your phone vibrate at any time of the night or day because I wanted you to buy more virtual widgets or whatever it might be. Well, I'll give you another even, uh, I guess even more obvious uh, example, LinkedIn. Like I looked at LinkedIn as this incredible gift where I can see your face, I can see your title, I can see where you are, I can see your entire, entire resume, I can like hyper target you. Oh, and I can see your friends too by looking at all your connections. What an incredible gift. And then like, this is getting better. I, I hope it's a good sign. But like a couple months ago, my, my connection request inbox were just filled with either the, like the generic, um, uh, like, looks like you're doing some impressive things. I'd love to be like the, the crazy, that kind of stuff. And the ones that the second you hit accept, you get the pitch slap, like, yeah. you know, which is I, I accept and then I get pitch slapped right away with some kind of a pitch. And then I've got to go through and disconnect. Like salespeople were ruining LinkedIn too. And LinkedIn to me is just this unbelievable gift that allows you to hyper target. And that if we use the right way, it can continue to, you know, be strong and survive and thrive. As, as the wise uh, Sam McKenna has said before, uh, let's connect, buy my stuff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, that's, that's what it, I mean, that's what it's like. And now, and now, I mean, you get it sometimes with voice or, or video. Oh, hey, Tom, let's connect. Yeah. Buy my stuff. And it's like, all right, well, I see Richard, but, you know, I'm not, I don't really want to buy your CRM right now. I'm in the middle of something, you know. Exactly. Exactly. So. Well, cool. I don't see any questions yet. Um, yet. So if you've got questions, throw them in. I know that was a bit of a history lesson, so probably a little difficult to ask questions. But as I go into this next part, you'll probably have a few. Remember at the beginning, um, Richard asked me to give myself like a quick kind of overview. And I talked about the fact that a research study changed my whole life and led me to this conclusion that, hey, there's actually a better way. Like there's no silver bullet, but I think there's one that's pretty close. And so I wanna, I wanna take a big lesson. This research study came from the world of e-commerce. And yet I'm talking about e-commerce, that, that industry that threatened to take all of our jobs, right? This was six years ago. Forrester put out an article that said that by the year 2020, a million B2B sales jobs would disappear because of the threat brought about by the ease of purchasing via e-commerce. I, I think when I look into the future, I want us to make whatever prognosticators are talking about the sales profession now, feel bad about their, uh, their prognostication, uh, just the way that we as a sales profession did here. We pivoted and we learned some incredible lessons along the way. And by 2020, sales didn't lose a million jobs. I, I don't know what the data is, but I'm guessing it probably added a couple million. All right, so Aaron, I see your question about what does a transparent tech stack look like? Let's talk about this transparency element and then we'll come back around to that one at the end here, all right? So here was the research study that changed my whole life. So I was the chief revenue officer of a company here in Chicago called Power Reviews. You probably guessed by the company name, Power Reviews was in the space of helping retailers and brands collect and display ratings and reviews on their website, right? So you're buying a pair of shoes on crocs.com. You look at the shoes, you scroll down, there's reviews. That was how us in the background 
helping with the collect and display. And we did it for another thousand companies. Here's what happened. We ended up working with Northwestern University here in Chicago on a study that was just meant to look at, all right, how do consumers interact with, like when a website's acting as a salesperson, what do people do? There was three data points that came out of it, two of which changed my whole life. All right. So the first one that didn't. Well, you like a drum roll. Uh, exactly. So here it comes. So the first one that didn't change my life because it was no surprise was that 96% of us read reviews before we buy something we haven't bought before that's of medium to high consideration. In other words, you're buying something you haven't bought before and it matters, you're going to read reviews. And the only surprise to me at that point was that there was still 4% that didn't look at reviews. Like, really? They, they um, live dangerously. Well, Power Reviews just updated the study and it's now over 99%, so I feel yeah. better. So that was number one, but here's the two data points that changed my, my life. Number one, 85% of us go to the negative reviews first. We skip the fives and go right to the fours, threes, twos, and ones. And again, this is when a website is acting as a salesperson. I'm gonna take you on the path to when a human is, but 85% of us read the negative reviews first. So we skip the fives and go right to the negatives. And the second data point is that when a product has an average review score between a 4.2 and a 4.5, that is optimal for purchase mm -hmm. conversion. Meaning a product that has negative reviews will sell better than a product that's got nothing but five-star reviews, right? So it, imagine, like, isn't that crazy? There's this company you may have heard of. I think they're called um, Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. Amazon, back in 1995, they decided, hey, we're going to sell products on our website and we're going to let people that have used those products come back and rip on them if they want. Like right under, we're going to have the product and right under it, we're going to let people say this product sucks. And guess what? Amazon did pretty well, right? This idea that negative and imperfection sells better than perfection was just mind blowing to me. So like a nerd that I am, what did I do? Well, I started digging into the neuroscience around it. I looked at, all right, when a website is acting as a salesperson, negative sells better, like that, that negative piece, that four, two to four, five, would that actually impact things in a human to human or B2B? Is this just the way we're wired? Or is that something that's specific to online? And it turns out, Transparency sells better than perfection, whether or not a website's acting as a salesperson or a human being is acting as a salesperson. All of the behavioral science research tells us that inherently we know that perfection is not real. It's not a real thing. And that when all we hear is 5-0 speak, it's like a screen that's capturing all of your BS language that until we can reduce that screen or that filter, we're not able to trigger a purchase decision within somebody. So again, on a website, when it's all like, hey, our product's great, I'm going to go right to the reviews because 99% of us are now reading them. I'm going to go right to the negatives because my brain is a prediction engine. It is wired to try to predict and it knows that if something is perfect, it ain't. All right. So all the behavioral science research tells us this, all the regular kind of data research tells us this. I'm going to talk through some of the practical application tells us this. But there's a, another reason, and a, a little side story here, Richard, for you. I, um, I, I left my job as CRL of Power Reviews to write a book, like a lunatic, right? Power Reviews at the time, from 2014 to 2017, Deloitte called Chicago's fastest growing tech company. So we were doing amazing, but I was like, I got to get these ideas out. So I left my job. I get a call from uh, this guy uh, who's my, my front cover endorser. It's a guy named Andy from uh, executive, uh, president of Salesforce. And he's like, Todd, I got another job that you can go do. And like, go do that for a couple of years. And the stories you'll have for your book are real. They're going to be amazing. And I was like, Andy, this isn't a memoir. I have to tell it right now. And there's a reason that I have to tell it right now. It's because of the proliferation of reviews and feedback on everything we do buy and experience. So, you know, like we talked about me being a sales historian. I don't know if you can see this, but this book is from 1916. Uh, this is the art and science of selling. Like, I wish you all could smell it. Uh, it smells like history. There's a whole chapter on honesty in here, right? Like about how honesty sells and how the truth is like, you know, that we need to do that. However, something's different about now. 
The proliferation of reviews and feedback on everything we do by an experience means that you can't hide your flaws and expect to get away with it anyway. We now have to embrace this idea of leading. 85% of us go to the negative reviews first, and that's what our brain is craving. Leading with those, hey, this is what we give up to be great at our core. This is what a competitor maybe does better than us in a category that you might care about. So let me give you a couple of examples, then we'll, we'll stop again and, and take a little, uh, like see if we can draw some Q&A out of you a little bit. Let's, let's just start by going to everybody's favorite retailer in the world, Ikea. Not, not your favorite? Ah, oh, all right, that's weird. Well, it's clearly the favorite for somebody because Ikea is the number one furniture retailer in the world for 13 straight years. And it's a nightmare, right? Like if it's a definitely a bad sign when you walk into a retailer and they have to hand you a map, right? Like that's, that's probably a bad sign. You finally find what you're looking for. Let's say it's bedroom furniture. No salespeople to help you out. I mean, nobody's going to help you feng shui your apartment. So you have to write down the code or take a picture of it with your phone because you are going to the warehouse yourself to go pull the 200 pound boxes off of shelves high up onto a cart that doesn't have brakes, which seems like a massive oversight to me, like just put a brake on it, roll it into the parking lot. You think you left the fun in the store, wait until you see the back end line just outside of the doors at Ikea where people are F-bombing their way through Tetris style, jamming these 200 pound boxes in the back of their hatchback. They drive home with a souvenir injury or two they get the boxes into their house, put it on the floor, open it up, thinking, all right, the worst is behind us. No, now you got 150 parts scattered across your floor and instructions that have no words on them other than the word like Svarta or whatever the, the brand name is from wherever the heck these products come from. You put the whole thing together, F-bomb your way through that, get a little endorphin rush and you're like, hey, that, that looks pretty good. You know what? Maybe we should go back and buy the end tables that go with this, right? Like it's stupid, but again, Ikea, number one furniture retailer in the world for 13 straight years. And you know why? It's because they are not shy about sharing what they give up to be great at their core, right? They say, hey, listen, you're going to come find it. You're going to you know, pick it out. You're going to pick it off of shelves. You're going to put it on a cart. You're going to jam it in the back of your car. You're going to lug it into your house. You're going to assemble it. But we do that so that you can have modern Scandinavian design furniture that you didn't pay much for. Oh, and there's some pretty decent meatballs upstairs. The point being, they are not shy about if somebody comes in and is like, hey, I'd like a salesperson to help me design my bedroom set. And they're like, oh, cool, all right. Room and boards down the street, there's a Macy's, there's a like Crate and Barrel, they got, they got some great furniture people there. Go there, that's not us. And now we've entered this era where we need to embrace that. And some of the most successful companies in the world, Ikea, Costco, like Costco, limited brand selection. You got to have a membership. You got to buy things like if you want some ranch dressing, hope you're hungry. You have to buy almost a gallon. You, oh, you need a toothbrush? Here's a half dozen for you. Hey, on your way out, we're going to have somebody standing at the door that's going to check your receipt against your cart to make sure you're not stealing anything. And yet... Costco, number two retailer in the country behind Walmart and well over a 90% membership renewal rate, right? It's because they embrace these things and there's an opportunity for you to do that too. And so let me, I'll tell you that story of when I first tried this and the magic that ensued as a result. There's, there's also something to be said about this. I think there's a classic uh, a marketing example of this with uh, Aleve, right? Aleve, it's the 24 hours strong or whatever it is. Well, when they were testing it, they found out that you couldn't take like six at a time. And that's where I, Johnson & Johnson or Procter & Gamble was like, cool, marketers, right? Being really smart, thinking about it, like, oh no, it's so strong. You only need to take one. Not like if you take six, it's going to ruin your, do bad things to your body here. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean- you think about like even like Southwest Airlines, right? Southwest Airlines embraced this idea of, hey, we're going to herd you on and herd you off and you're going to love it. And we're going to put some comedians up uh, making the announcements and taking you through your security. But hope you don't want anything good to drink. Hope you don't want a meal. You ain't going to get it, right? And guess what? Southwest is one of the uh, most profitable companies and most profitable airlines in the industry. And they, because they're 
not shy about proclaiming to the world, hey, this is what we give up. None of you that are selling anything are all things to all people. Like, let's just embrace that right now. Any of you that have competitors have competitors that are a better fit for certain customers than you. Not all customers are equally desirable. And we need to embrace those ideas, identify those, because here's the thing. When we do this, our sales cycles speed up because we're helping the buying brain trigger that decision mechanism. Again, our brains are trying to predict. We are like, like that's the whole key to making a decision is we predict and then we come to an assessment based on feelings as to whether we feel like the juice is going to be worth the squeeze, right? And if you don't think that uncertainty is a crazy maker for the brain, let's go back to March of 2020 and go drive by your local Costco and see people lined up to buy toilet paper, right? Uncertainty drives us crazy. It drives us crazy in a purchase circumstance too, that we need certainty. And so you speed sales cycles by helping the buying brain predict through transparency. Your win rates go up partially because you're qualifying deals in better and faster that you should win. But more importantly, if you're going to lose, you lose faster, right? So you can spend your time on the opportunities that are worth pursuing. And in the end, it's fun. The other element of that is you make it really, really hard on your competitors to compete against you too. And so let me, I'll tell you that story. Then we'll go back and take a look at the, the, the couple of questions that came in. Um, I, uh, so I had just kind of come fresh off of this research, right? And I was like, it, my, the way my brain works, it kind of goes into this nerdy downward spiral of like, I got to figure this out. I got to try this. When am I going to get the opportunity to do this though? And like, how do I trust a rep to be able to do this at this point where I don't even know how it's going to work? And so I, uh, I had two days scheduled in, in New York fly there one morning, got an afternoon meeting, and then a dinner, and then the next day, a couple of meetings, then I was going to fly back. I, I fly there, I land, check my phone, first meeting, which was like a massive meeting in the afternoon, had to postpone. Like, ah, I suddenly have like two or three hours completely open in New York, which is not the worst thing, but I was like, All right, I'm just going to go find a Starbucks and just get some work done. So I start heading to the Starbucks. I, I'm the CRO at this point, my VP of sales in Chicago texts me and he's like, dude, we just got an incredible lead in. The lead is from a big apparel manufacturer. Uh, uh, we're all friends. It's Calvin Klein. So Calvin Klein comes in as an inbound lead. So I'm just walking and I call him up. I'm like, hey, tell me about it. Like, what, what are the details of this thing? He's like, all right, well, they're just starting their evaluation. They're in the process of creating an RFP. Oh, goody. Everybody loves a good RFP. It's everyone's favorite word. <laughs> exactly. Like we can't wait to do RFP responses. And then uh, they're going to have us fly up to New York to do the full dog and pony show. And then they'll make it sit, you know, that whole. And I was like, I forgot they're in New York. Oh, hey, I know this is a one in a hundred shot. So no pressure on you or the rep, like seriously. But I literally, and this is the truth. I have a meeting that just canceled and I'm going to be sitting here in New York for three hours. I know Calvin Klein's they're in Manhattan, so they can't be that far away. Can you have the rep reach out to their head of e-commerce and just tell them I'm in town, I've got a few hours open and just see if he wants to grab coffee. And he's like, yeah, sure, we'll try it. Well, who knew it worked, right? They ended up, like the guy said yes and said, come on over. So I head over to Calvin Klein's headquarters, check in, go up to the fifth floor elevator to meet him. He meets me by the elevators. By the way, side note, Calvin Klein's walls and their offices are covered in pictures of people in their underwear. So if you ever go, just be prepared to be a little bit uncomfortable by like, eh, am I not supposed to be looking at this? this is crazy. But anyway, I meet him. We go into his office, again, Manhattan office. So it's not very big. I walk in, this head of e-commerce uh, looks at me and hands, the first thing he does, he's all New York. Like there was no small talk, um, which it was, it's not a bad thing, right? But he, First thing he does, he's like, hey, Todd, here's the HDMI cable for your, your presentation. I'm like, I, I thought we were having coffee. Like, what? And so I'm, I'm looking at this HDMI cable and my, my wheels are turning. Like, how did this get set up? Like, oh, crap. I don't, I don't have anything to present. I look to my right and it got 10 times worse. Seven people rolling chairs into his office. So now there's me. There's eight of them and we're all like elbow to elbow in this little hot summer Manhattan office. This dude, again, New York style, 
comes right at me to start this meeting. He's like, Todd, we're looking at you. We're looking at your competitor. How are you better? And like the, like I could see all the eyes on me and like people's arms were like going up, like, all right, here comes the sales pitch. Like their filters were definitely on. And so again, my wheels going crazy. And I'm like, what the hell? I, I think this is my one chance to try this out. And so I, here was my answer. So again, he starts with, how are you better? My response was, hey, before we get too deep into this, can I actually share how that competitor you're looking at is better than us? And I, I know that sounds crazy, but they just delivered and launched a new add-on to their core solution that not only do we not have, but not even on our roadmap. Like we hadn't even considered it. And so if that's gonna be an important consideration, you've got seven people in here that are writing an RFP, they're going through this whole process that we could save a lot of time and like flying people to New York, it's kind of expensive too. Like I want my team to be working on the right match too. And so can we start there? They all kind of looked at each other like, we hadn't even heard about that, what is it? Like, oh, here it is. And I literally went into a pitch as though I was the competitor. It's like, here's what it does. Their first um, customer, their marquee like beta customer is in the apparel space. Um, and like, here's, like, here's the thought process around how it's gonna work. Um, we, so we, had a, we, we talk about that a little bit. They go around and they're like, hey, why would we go to a reviews provider for that? I'm like, I, I don't know. They, they must have done some market research. Like I, and so they, they end up souring on this add-on to the point where the head of e-commerce is like, Todd, listen, first of all, if we are interested a couple of years down the line in that kind of thing, what are you going to do? And I was like, what am I going to do? They just launched the thing yesterday. I don't even know. Man, like, I'm just learning it myself. But uh, the second piece was they said, listen, we're, that's not important to us. Like it's not going to be an important consideration. It's not a consideration for the RFP. Like, all right, cool. So I end up going into, hey, listen, we're not developing that kind of stuff because that's outside of our core. Our core is X, right? And I take them through that. This is what we're trying to be the best in the world at. And given what you're trying to do, I went online, I showed them a couple of examples of apparel companies. We're 15 minutes into this meeting. This guy stops the meeting and says to everybody else, hey, if you all heard enough, and they're like, yeah, yeah, we're good. We're good. Cool. They take their chairs. They leave. Me and the head of e-commerce does something that like in the history of me selling, like I'm old, I'm aging like guacamole over here. The something happened that I never, ever experienced. He pulls a folder off his credenza, opens it up. It's his budget. Fifth line down ratings and reviews technology and a number. And he's like, can you hit that? And so we ended up getting into a conversation about the dollars right there. 10 days, so I, we leave the meeting. I thought he was gonna hug me by the pictures of people in their underwear, which would have been really crazy. But I, I fly back to Chicago, 10 days later, I'm in my office, I'm in a meeting, phone rings. I see on the caller ID, it's Calvin Klein. I'm like, I gotta get this, it's the guy. He's calling to tell me that they've decided not to do the RFP and not to have anybody fly up and that they just felt more comfortable and felt like there was a stronger alignment and they've decided to go with us. 10 days and what normally would be a six month sales process, right? The other fun thing about it, if uh, for any of you that ever watched the movie Eight Mile, where there's the end uh, rap battle where Eminem basically just throws all of his negatives on the table and lets the competitor try to compete against that and the guy's got nothing. He, uh, this head of e-commerce wanted to also tell me, he was like, look, um, I told them that we're gonna go with you they immediately went into a pitch for their new add-on. I had to stop them and tell them, I've already heard all about it uh, from Power Reviews actually, and it's not going to be something that's important. And of course, them being skeptical, they were like, I, I don't know what they told you, but like Gap is our first customer. And they're like, we know, we know. We, we. And so the, the funny part of this whole thing is when you do this right, if that would have been an important consideration, I would have had a team of people filling out RFPs I would have been expensing, you know, flights back and forth to New York. But instead, if we would have lost right then, that would have been okay, right? Because we would have spent our time on the opportunities that we should win. But the fun thing was that we won and we won faster and we won faster consistently as a result of just helping to be a partner with our customers and leading with those imperfections and leading with those things we give up instead of trying to present and pretend that we are perfect. 
So there were, there were about ten. That's great. Everyone who's ever worked with me has heard the eight mile story about a thousand times. So Todd, thank you for bringing it here and, and elevating it beyond just one crazy sales leader. For those <laughs> of you who, who didn't attend our session earlier today, uh, Marcus and Connor and uh, Matt were all talking about how to how to educate your team and how to enable your team because there is there's a scarcity mentality that some organizations have where it's like oh if we don't if we don't close Calvin Klein that's it we're we're done and there's a an organizational discipline that you have to have about who you are and and who you're not and and it's almost more important who you're not because if you try to as Todd was saying before be all things to all people, you're going to get gobbled up by maybe it's point solutions in your space that do that little thing for that vertical perfectly. Right. Um, but Todd, I, I love, I love that. I love that example. Man. Well, yeah. And there's a couple of questions. I want to talk about Lisa's first. So Lisa, um, she had asked, like, do you have examples of leading, you know, like the, those Ikea and Costco or low cost providers? And yeah, absolutely. Uh, and hopefully that Calvin Klein gave you an example because we were certainly not. Uh, one of my, my, clients that I've spent a lot of time with and you know doing workshops around all of this is uh, in the antivirus space. So antivirus technology. You know how many companies according to an anti, there's an analyst for antivirus technologies, who knew? Um, you know how many companies are in that space according to the analyst? 56, like 56 companies that are in that space. This client that I'm working with, and like this is a little back padding, but it, the science tells us why, is that they are consistently winning and the analyst had them ranked at the top of a study they did around transparency, honesty, and setting proper expectations for customers so that those customers stay, buy more, and advocate on your behalf. And it comes from this idea of, hey, we can differentiate in price. We can differentiate in features and benefits. We can differentiate in our approach, all that. I think that there's an opportunity to differentiate in the way that you sell to. When you're competitors are bashing you and talking about themselves as though you're perfect. And you're walking in and going, hey, yeah, there's a couple of things we're not very good at. And as a matter of fact, that competitor is really good at something that you might care about. Let's, can we talk about that first? Vetting those things. There's also another piece that I want you to think about here. I'm going to put myself in the middle of a chart. So, hi. Um, all right. So there was a study that was done in 2017 by the Corporate Executive Board, which is now part of Gartner. What they did is they looked at when a consensus purchase is taking place, so there's multiple buyers, where do they spend their time? Now, as it turns out, only 39% of their time is spent talking to you, talking to your competitors, or talking to their internal buying team. So that's the 22 plus the 17 here. 61% of their time is spent doing other stuff. And what's that other stuff? That other stuff is back channeling you, right? checking references, independent analysts, peers, Glassdoor. They, they can't get at the imperfections from you. So they've got to go start doing all this other homework. Now, at the time, the study was presented as though that's a foregone conclusion and we better buckle up. I don't believe that. I believe that when you do the homework for the buyer, that 61% starts to shrink because you know that your buyers are going to do research. I would like afterwards, just Google your own company in terms of, Write in, what is it like to work with, and then write a, a, your own company. Guess what's probably the first couple of things that are going to come up if you're a company of any substance, meaning like lots of employees, probably Glassdoor. Now, why would a buyer want to look at Glassdoor? Glassdoor is a place, uh, as you know, where current and former employees can leave feedback around what it's like to work in that environment, what's it like to interview there, what kinds of questions, all that kind of stuff. Your buyers they're not just buying you and your product solutions technology. They're buying you. Like they want to know that you don't hate your job and everybody like can't stand it there, right? And the culture blows. So go embrace those things. I implore any of you to go out and start to pull all of this information together. So go to these sites and curate this stuff. All right. And then we're going to, I mean, Richard, like why wouldn't we impart the wisdom of a supermodel here? I think it's like I mean, if we if we ever get the chance, presidents, supermodels, car yes. sales, we've hit on a lot of things here today. It's been a journey and we, we gotta we gotta get that out. <laughs> exactly. So Tyra Banks. So Tyra Banks, you know, a corporate mogul, former supermodel, she had coined a term, and that term is flossum. 
Flossum means to embrace your flaws and know that you are still awesome. And what I, why this is an important term is I'm not telling any of you to go into your next sales engagement and go, hey, everybody, this is why we suck. Like, no, no take it easy. Remember that 4-2 to 4-5 that we talked about at the beginning, right? That, that imperfection is still good enough, right? But that alignment becomes so important. Embrace the things that you give up to be great at your core. That story that I told about Calvin Klein, would I have preferred that that story and that, or I'm sorry, that that add-on, that new released solution, that add-on, would I have preferred that the competitor pitch that or that I get to pitch it and get to control the message, right? Like that's at the core. I know it sounds crazy and it takes a lot of guts, but I think it actually, in today's era, with again, the proliferation of reviews and feedback on everything we do buy and experience, you have to figure out how to do this. And now is the time. Like I said, it, 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 the transparency sale is not a memoir. And here's the second piece, Richard, and I'll, I'll kind of let's start to wrap up on this. There, there's this, um, th th this title for this conference is The Funnel is Dead. As a sales rep, you might come out of this going, yeah, you know what? I get it. Like, yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, I'm one of those people that read the negative reviews first. And if there's no negative reviews, I don't believe it and I don't buy. And oftentimes when there's no negative reviews, I leave and I don't, come. like, that's me. And I totally get that human beings are, like our buyers are human beings. I get that. But what ends up happening is that your sales leader potentially doesn't, right? Your sales leader is just like, why would you tell him that? Are you crazy? Right? Like, sales leadership needs to embrace this idea too. When, when I think about the funnel is dead, I think about this old thing that I did wrong as a sales leader, right? And that was, and, and my board reinforced that with me too, where I was always one of those people that was like, hey, um, you as a sales rep, you all need to have 4X your quota in pipeline at all times, right? Like you, you have to, you have to right? Like where, where's your pipeline load? Because if you don't have 4X, you're not going to have enough to hit your quota. And guess what my reps would do? They'd fill their pipeline with 4X crap, right? It was just garbage. And they didn't want to disqualify anything because then they're not at their 4X, which is an important metric. When I think about the funnel is dead, I know, um, Richard, you talk about the, was it the, uh, the bow tie? Um, the, the, the blow tie, the, sorry, the bow tie or the, uh, the flywheel. Yeah, I just, I think that this era of sales leadership thinking about a funnel as the proper way to go about this, I think that it just creates a ton of time wasted. It creates a huge opportunity cost with your sales reps working on opportunities that you know they're going to lose. We've got to get to this place where we start to lose fast and we embrace those things. And I'll, I'll kind of finish up on this last little example for you, and then we'll stop and we'll just focus on Q&A for the, the last 10 minutes we have here. With all of you, I just, I want you to imagine this. Um, imagine that you're going to go uh, biking. So you've got a, 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 there's a group of people that are going to go biking. Um, there, there's two groups and there's two leaders, one path, right? There's, and so group number one comes to leader number one and says, hey, we, we want to take the biking trail. And so that leader number one is like, all right, cool. Here's the map. Um, you're going to love this ride. Like this ride, it is so beautiful. Just make sure you take it all in. It's my favorite. It's so, it's so great. You're just going to love it. Here's the map. Go have fun. I can't wait to hear about it on the way out. So that's group one. Group two comes to leader number two. Leader number two is like, oh, you want to take the path? Well, here's the map. Couple of things before you go. Number one is you're going to get about a half mile in. There's a tree that overhangs. And right after it, it's a little steep and the gravel's a little loose. And there's an embankment. When you see that overhang, make sure you slow down. And then once you get past that and make the turn, look up because the view is beautiful. It is you're, like, take some time and take some pictures there. You're going to love it. And I can't wait to hear what you think on the back end. And if you're not cool with the, the embankment part, don't go. At the end, group one gets done. What are they talking about? Group one, same path. is like, oh gosh, like at dinner or over beers or whatever, they're like, remember when we almost died? Holy crap, that was incredible. Remember the loose gravel in that embankment? I thought you were, go I thought you were going off, Richard. I, I swear, I thought. That's group one. Group two, what's group two going to remember? 
oh god the, the view was amazing right after that little area when we made that turn like that view is one that's going to stay with me for the rest of my life and the next time i'm in this area i'm i'm taking all of my friends on this path it is awesome same path same day completely different memories can you do that when you think about your customers and your prospects create proper expectations embrace what you give up to be great at your core and in the end i my my advice for all of you to spend some time as sales people with your marketing team with client success talk to customers that are renewing when the customer renews ask them hey i think i know why you renewed but why did you renew and dig into those types of things if you can answer these two questions for yourself and then not be afraid to lead with it i'm telling you there's magic out there what are you giving up to be great at your core? Meaning what's your pick it, pack it, jam it, assemble it. And what is your great core? Your modern Scandinavian design furniture that you didn't pay much for and your Swedish meatballs upstairs. So with that, I'd love to take your questions and I'll hang along, uh, hang around as long as you need me. Uh, first, thank you, thank you for this. We got a couple. We got a couple questions in there. One, one thing I wanted to ask, though, from just your perspective before we jump into this, there's there's one component of it where it's like the review score, right? And that matters, right? That four two to was four two to four five or something like that. Have you started to see any research around volume, as well? Oh, right? sure. And, and and is there is there a certain volume that you look for to like? What, what do our brains say if they see that? Well, yeah, I think, I mean, so let's talk about volume for a second, not in terms of reviews, because the reviews are only an indication of how we should be considering the way buyers buy and what triggers purchase decisions, right? Sure, they're reading the reviews and all that, but you should be the reviews that the customers read. You should be imparting to the customer, here's what we're great at, and here's what doesn't always go perfect. Here's what we're great at. Here's what a customer does better than us. So like number of reviews and all that, like don't get too hung up on that. However, I, the, the way that I look at the data about review volume is thinking about this idea of sales reps that, um, and I used to, I did this, that you got to create the impression that you're in demand. And what I mean by that is just imagine you and a, a buddy, you're in a town you've never been in before. So you're walking down the street, you're like, hey, you wanna grab something to eat? Like, yeah, yeah, let's go. You look down the street and there's yeah. a restaurant on the left and a restaurant on the right. Restaurant on the left looks kind of empty. Like you don't see any activity around it, but the restaurant on the right, man, there's, there's people around, there's a buzz. You can see people in the window. They're, they look like they're laughing. Where do you go? Well, clearly you go to the one on the right, right? Because our brains like it when others have done their homework for us. Right, like I, that, that's what our brain, and so that volume component is important because we like to borrow other people's brains. And so when you just think about that, being in demand is a core component of this. And so when you're thinking about driving a review strategy, which I think is separate to just this whole idea of human to human transparency, that yeah, you, you've got to start to build up some volume. Otherwise um, customers are gonna feel like they have to do more homework. So okay. absolutely. Yeah, it's just, I, I like that restaurant analogy. We're like, you know, I know it was well reviewed, but nobody in there. It's yeah. like the clock. Like what's, what's going on with this place? What could it be? And by the way, there was, a, as I was teaching this once, there was um, an individual in one of my, like one of the teams I was teaching whose dad uh, ran a, uh, like kind of a, it's not a cafe. It's a place where you, you order, like go up to the counter and order food. Um, and so one of the things that he did, because he always knew in his heart that this was the case, was if there was no line, he would just go stand by the counter, right? And be looking up at it and just hanging out until people showed up. Now that's, that's you know, using this for maybe evil, not good. But the point being, again, is that we like it when others have done our homework for us. And so that volume component is pretty important. Interesting, so, interesting. Well, we got, uh, we've got a few questions in the Q&A panel. We got about five minutes left here. Any one of those juicy ones that you wanna hop into first? Um, let's see. The, well, the, the first one, uh, Anand writes, um, I find that today you need to be good at everything. Great salespeople have a great website, great cold callers, great email campaigners, great sales. Yeah, you cannot. What do you think we can give up in our sales arsenal? Well, ah, that's, that's really, really good. Um, here's, a, I, I got to tell this story. I, I was with Exact Target during our unicorn run. 
right? Where we built up the company. We had an incredible IPO. We sold for $3 billion in 2013. I, I don't know if anybody is on here that was uh, a part of that, but our, one of the, the board members addressed us during our global sales and services kickoff. And his whole talk was about, and I, I don't even know where this came from. We were all like, is he really saying this? But he's like, you're all average. Like what? He's like, at this volume, as you're growing and you're hiring so many people, it is impossible for you to all be complete all-stars. That's impossible. And he talked about this idea that our, our customers know that. Like as companies get bigger and bigger, you're going to work with great people and not great people because at volume, it's impossible to all be perfect and all be all-stars. And so as a result, I, I, don't think, um, I don't think our customers are looking for us to be all complete all-stars in all things. And they're not going to check. They're not checking resumes. They're not checking any of that. But at its core, I, I just truly believe, obviously I'm biased, but when you change the game, it, I got to, if you don't mind, Richard, I got to tell one quick story that, that tells this whole, this whole thing. I, at Power Reviews, our biggest competitor was a, a company called Bizarre Voice. So maybe, maybe you've heard of them. I'm, I remember sitting in my office, I'm on LinkedIn and I get a LinkedIn uh, invite from a head of e-commerce for a big Talbot, Talbots, um, big retail uh, like e-commerce brand. Um, their head of e-commerce connects with me on uh, LinkedIn. I, I look, I, like I accept it right away. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I look at his profile. It says that he's on the advisory board for, for Bizarre Voice too. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what he wants. I accepted it. I wasn't going to pitch slap him. Um, well, literally about 10 minutes later, I get a note from him saying, hey, can you talk? Um, would love to uh, get to know you because you're clearly doing some amazing things. Uh, any chance that we can talk like right away? And I'm like, yeah, of course. So we scheduled the, the call for like 15 minutes later. I called my rep uh, that on the account and I was like, hey, can you do what we do? Um, and so this is, this is kind of a different thing than transparency, but you're gonna see that when, when, you, when you do this right, magic can happen. I, I had the rep go look at their website and go interact with them as though he was a consumer. In 10 minutes, he found something that was amazing. I get on the phone with this guy and he's like, listen, Todd, um, you're, you're kicking their butt right now. Why? What is it that, why are you guys so great? And I was like, hey, uh, be before we go down that path, I, I just had uh, somebody take a look at your website. We noticed something that, um, just an idea for you that it's not something that makes us unique, but you know, Bizarre Voice can fix this. Uh, I would suggest that as soon as we hang up, you call your client success person to fix this thing. And uh, he was like, what? what? What are you talking about? And I was like, here, here's a link to a sweater on your website, right? And so we went to the sweater page, we looked to the reviews um, and I was like, this looks great. You're, you're asking for size fit information too. So sweater fit too small, too big or just right. And he's like, yeah, we're really proud of that. We use that uh, a lot. And I was like, all right, here's a link to a fragrances uh, product. So perfume. And he's like, all right, I, uh, uh, what? Uh, 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 and I was like, yeah, you can see you're, you're collecting size and fit information on your fragrances. And, and they've got a different template that they can plug in, just call them up and tell them to swap the templates. And, and he was just like, how long did it take you to find that? And I was like, well, you reached out to me 15 minutes ago, so 10 minutes. And he was like, I get it. I get why you're winning. I get why you're winning. And it was this idea of putting the customer first, right? That lead them to us, not lead with us and teach them at every interaction. And that's, that's just a lesson that I think everybody can take is make this about the customer. It's not competitive. It's about helping and being right by the customer. And that gives you an opportunity, like I said, to differentiate in the way that you sell. And I believe to this, this you know, right now, we did that through transparency and putting the customer first. And I think going back and wrapping this all up in a bow, 1916, Woodrow Wilson wanted salespeople to put the customer first, and we did. And America established itself as a world leader on the industrial stage. I think we've got an opportunity to get back to that. Not only because it sell, but that it feels better to be honest and transparent, but it sells better too, right? We have to do it right now. And I would love over the next year or two to see us start to build our way back up 
on Gallup's uh, trusted professions list because we don't need to be at the bottom forever. And I think transparency is a great place to start. Uh, that this was this was simply awesome. It was the history lesson. Great storytelling. Um, if you can impart our audience with one last piece of wisdom here, try to condense everything we've talked about down into just a maybe tweet length. Uh, <laughs> other people's brains. Uh, I, I loved that quote. Right, the scores for the reviews. What's one thing that you want folks to take home for that? Well, yeah, I mean, transparency sells better than perfection. And due to the proliferation of reviews and feedback, we now have to do it anyway. And that last piece is embrace your flossum, right? Embrace the things that you give up to be great at your core. Think like Ikea and flossum, being flossum sells better than trying to be perfect. And now we need to do it anyway. It's, the time has come and I'm telling you, if you do this right, you're gonna see magic results to the point, like I said, where I left my job to write a book about it because I thought it was that important. And that's, that's, uh, I still feel that way in a big way. Well, Todd, thank you so much for your time, folks. Thanks again to our amazing sponsors for this. And then in just a little bit less than an hour, we're going to be talking all things data with Adam Stewart. Can't necessarily map that customer journey unless you've got the data everywhere. But Todd, uh, this is the first time in a long time we've had you on. It was awesome. It wasn't flossum. It was awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone stay safe, Todd, and everybody have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care, everybody. Thank you.